right, Luke chapter 9. Uh, we left off with the call to discipleship. Let me just bring us up to speed here. We left off with the call to discipleship. Jesus said this, uh, verse, beginning in verse 23. He said, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For, verse 24, whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and is himself destroyed or lost? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words, of him, the Son of Man, will be ashamed when he comes in his own glory and in his Father's and of the holy angels. Jesus here, he has already called and commissioned his disciples, sent about two by two, told them to go and to preach the gospel and all, and, all, and he's preparing them for that time when, you know, he is going to ascend into heaven and they are going to receive the great commission and they are going to go out, and so Jesus has sent them out. Um, he sent them out to preach the kingdom of God. He sent them out to heal the sick. And after they returned, then Jesus coached them. He coached them in their compassion, first of all. He wanted them to see the multitudes as he saw them. And so they went out, and, and he, you know, there they are. They're tired from serving, and the multitudes are there, and the disciples are tempted to say, hey, Jesus, send them away. And Jesus says, no, no, we're not going to send them away. We're going to care for them. We're going to feed them. And in that, he's coaching them in their capabilities. He wants them to understand the limits of their own capabilities, that when you step out to serve people in the strength and the power of the Holy Spirit, that pretty quickly you're going to come up against the end of your own personal capabilities. And Jesus wants them to understand that it's not about your capabilities, it's about my capability. And so Jesus then <clears throat> will work supernaturally and cause this feeding of the 5,000 and this supernatural work. And in all this, Jesus is coaching his disciples and then as they confess, Jesus says, the Christ, the Son of the living God. When Jesus says, hey, who do, who do people say that I am and who do you say that I am? And it always comes down to that. Who do you say that I am? And as they confess, Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, then Jesus began to reveal his mission to these disciples began to, to talk to them about how his mission was to die for sin, how he's going to give his life as a ransom for many, how he's going to be resurrected in glory. And in the process of explaining what his mission is to these disciples, he then turns to the disciples and he begins to explain to his disciples, hey, what following him, what serving him looks like. They've confessed faith. It's not an issue of, hey, this is what you got to do to earn a right standing with me. This is what you got to do to be saved. No, he starts saying, hey, all right, you've confessed. I'm the Christ. I'm the son of the living God. And that's your faith. So your salvation there, that's, that's, that's the, you, we're not talking about that. Now let me tell, talk to you about a child of God, because that's who you're confessing to be. So if you're a child of God, I'm going to tell you what's going to be the requirement of your life. Let me start telling you what a disciple looks like. And so here in these verses, Jesus giving it to his disciples the, 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 the critical understanding of what the four requirements of being a disciple is. And also what the three stumbling blocks to being a disciple, what those are as well in these verses that we just read. And I don't have time to go over those four uh, requirements of a disciple, those three stumbling blocks. Hopefully you were here for the message. If you weren't, I would encourage you to listen to the last couple of weeks' messages in Luke. But that's Jesus going through. Hey, there's four requirements of being a disciple. There's three stumbling blocks to being a disciple. And so as he goes through that, listen, what we understand, what we learn in this text is that one of the foundational in truths that informs Jesus' instructions here in Luke chapter 9 is that a key component of being a disciple is that we possess a sober understanding that we live in two worlds. That being a disciple of God means that we understand that we live in this world, but that our citizenship is in the kingdom of God. That we are citizens of the kingdom of God, in, embodied in, in this flesh, in this world. And the idea is that informs these four requirements of being a disciple that Jesus talks about. That informs these three stumbling blocks that Jesus speaks of in verses 23 through 26 that we just read. 
that we can live for ourselves in this life here on earth or we can live for the Lord with a focus on the life to come. And in Philippians chapter 3, the Apostle Paul kind of touches on this, talks about this, put on screen for you. He says, there are many whose conduct shows that they're really enemies of the cross of Christ. They're headed for destruction. Their God is their appetite. They brag about shameful things, and they think only about this life here on earth, but we are citizens of heaven, Paul says, where the Lord Jesus Christ lives, and we are eagerly waiting for him to return as our Savior. Now pay very close attention to this next verse. He says, he, Jesus, will take our weak mortal bodies and will change them into glorious bodies like his own, using the same power with which he will bring everything under his control. Now that promise that Paul makes to the Philippians in verse 21 there that we've just read, to change our bodies into glorified bodies, this is known as the doctrine of glorification. And that's the focus of our study here this morning. The doctrine of glorification. Simply stated, the doctrine of glorification is that there is something magnificent that awaits us beyond this life. There is something that will blow your mind. If you are born again, if you are a child of God, not only are you going to escape eternal death, but you will be transformed and you will be glorified together with Jesus Christ. That's the doctrine of glorification. And that promised transforming power is what Jesus now begins to demonstrate. Verse 27, he sets it up. He says, I tell you truly, there are some standing here who shall not taste death until they see the kingdom of God. See, he had just said in the previous verse not to be ashamed of him and that Jesus is going to be coming in his glory. And, and this is what he's referring to. He says, hey, some of y'all, you're going to see this glory before you go yourselves to be in glory. Verse 28, and now it came to pass about eight days after these sayings, that he took Peter and John and James and he went up on a mountain to pray. And as he prayed, the appearance of his face was altered and his robe became white and glistening. And behold, two men talked with him who were Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his decease, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. But Peter and those with him were heavy with sleep. And when they were fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. And then it happened, as they were parting from him, that Peter said to uh, Jesus, Master, it's good for us to be here. And let us make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. And while he was saying this, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were fearful as they entered the cloud. And a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved son, hear him. And when the voice had ceased, Jesus was found alone, but they kept quiet and told no one in those days any of the things that they had seen. Jesus here, he is showing his disciples the tangible example of their future glorification. It's what he's showing to them. In other words, Jesus is giving to his disciples physical proof that life doesn't end with the cross, that it ends with glory. See, he had just been talking to them <coughs> about all the difficulties that they were going to face. You know, basically, Jesus there, in, you know, in verse 27, when he says, I tell you truly, there's some of you standing here, you know, you're not going to taste death till you see the, the, the glory, till you see the kingdom of God. Basically, what Jesus is, is in effect doing here is he, he's saying, look, I've shared with you guys some difficult truths. I, I've talked to you about what, what, what is the cost of being a disciple, how you got to die to yourself, how do you have to die to your earthly desires, have to, you, you have to pick up your cross daily and follow after me. But listen, what you need to understand is that there's a reward at the end of all this. Life doesn't end with the cross. That's where it just begins, man. It ends in glory. And so he's given them this tangible proof. He's saying, look, I'm going to show you this thing. You're, you're going to experience glory like you've never imagined. I'm going to give you that glimpse to show you that cross bearers are ultimately glory receivers. That's what Jesus is doing here. 
And you know, the thing is, in giving us this picture, maybe, you know, you're familiar with this, and I'll be brief on this, but the story of Florence Chadwick, you know, she swam across the, the Catalina Channel in, in, back in the 50s, and she made it all the way across um, and got within 100 yards of the beach, but she gave up because the fog had set in, and she didn't realize she was 100 yards from the, from the shore, and so she came on the boat, and of course, you know, seeing that she was so close to the shore, she wept, she was heartbroken, and she vowed in her heart, this isn't going to happen to me again. And so the next time she went to swim the channel, the same fog set in, but she had in her mind's eye, no, 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 the shore has to be just right there. It was just right there last time. I'm going to press on. And what Jesus is doing here for his disciples is he's kind of giving them that sort of picture. He's saying, listen, you know, you got, you're called to be a disciple, to die to yourself and to pick up your cross and all that, but it doesn't end with that. It ends with glory. And I want to give you a glimpse of the glory that is, that is going to be revealed, my glory. And listen, the understanding that when Christ, who is our life, appears, that we're going to be with him in glory as well. See, Paul gave that picture to the Colossians, taking a, a, a cue from, from what Jesus did, you know, literally being transformed. Paul wanted the Colossians to get this same picture. And so Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 4, we read that Paul tells the Colossians, if then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things of the earth, for you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. And then he says this, when Christ, who is our life, appears, here's the hope, then you also will appear with him in glory. Again, notice in these verses, Paul's touching on the same elements that Jesus touches on here in Luke chapter 9. He's talking about death to self. He's talking about death to earthly forces and desires. To death to an earthly focus and death to our earthly desires. But the key, hey, keep your eye, keep your mind on the future glory. Now listen, here's why this doctrine of glorification is so important for us today. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes 3.11 that God has placed eternity into the hearts of men. And what that means is that God has placed within you and me this intrinsic knowledge. We have this intrinsic knowledge that there is something more. That there is something beyond the grave. And so deep down, everybody knows this. And it's that intrinsic knowledge that is supposed to guide us, drive us to seek out the true and the living God. That's the knowledge that, hey man, there's something more. This intrinsic knowledge drives men to seek answers to what are known as the big three. Uh, you know, where did I come from? Why am I here? Where am I going? It's that intrinsic knowledge that God has placed eternity into your heart. And so we ask those questions because of that. Where do I come from? Why am I here? And where am I going? And because God is a good God, because He's a loving God, listen, He gives us answers to these questions in His Word. And He gives to the disciples here the example to encourage them that, listen, you're going to be glorified together with Jesus Christ. But listen, not everybody is going to listen to the answers that God provides. When we ask ourselves the, these big three questions, where did I come from, why am I here, where am I going, not everybody is satisfied to get their answer from God's Word. As a matter of fact, let me use that last question, where am I going. There's, there's all kinds of examples where people go and they get wacky answers and they will, they'll seek out answers separate from God's Word, distinctly different than God's Word, to satisfy that question, where am I going to go when I die? Maybe you'll remember the Heaven's Gate cult that was in the news years ago in San Diego. They asked the question, where do we go when we die? And here's how they answered it. They said, where you're going to go when you die is on a spaceship behind Halley's Comet. Remember that? Go get yourself a brand new pair of tennis shoes and kill yourself, and then you'll wind up on this spaceship behind Halley's Comet. No joke, that's, that was their answer. Uh, the Mormon church, they answer the question, where am I going to go when I die? Well, they say, well, you're going to go to your own planet that you get to populate just you and, and all the women that you're going to have on the planet. That's where you go when you die. See, they answer the question really distinctly apart from God's word. How about Hindus and Buddhists? What do they say, where are we going to go when we die? 
They say, well, we're going to be reincarnated. Now I always think about the great cowboy poet Wallace McRae when we talk about reincarnation. You probably heard me say this before, but it's fun, so let's go for it. So, you know, the great cowboy poet. What is reincarnation? Cowboy asks his friend. Well, it starts as old pal told him when your life comes to an end. They wash your face, they comb your hair, they clean your fingernails, they put you in a padded box away from life's travails. And the box in you goes in the ground, in a hole that's been dug in the ground, and reincarnation starts in once you're planted neath that mound. Them clods melt down just like the box in you who is inside, and that's when you begin your transformation ride. And in a while, the grass will grow upon your rendered mound until someday... Upon that spot, a lonely flower is found. And then a horse may wander by and graze upon the flower that once was you. Thus has begun your vegetative bower. Now the flower that the horse done eat, along with the grass and other feed, makes bone and fat and muscle, which is essential to the steed. But there's a part that he can't use. And so it passes through and there it lays upon the ground, this thing that once was you. Now, if perchance I, I should pass by and see this on the ground, I'll, I'll stop a while and I'll ponder at this object that I've found, and I'll think about reincarnation and life and death and such, and I'll come away concluding, why, you ain't changed all that much. <laughs> now, a little commercial break there for us, but that's what I think about when we talk about reincarnation. There ain't no such thing as reincarnation. We, we need, when we're talking about these questions, where do I come from? Why am I here? Where am I going? We got to know God answers these questions in his word. And listen, the Bible doesn't talk about reincarnation, but the Bible does talk about transformation. Transformation. And the Bible promises that in Jesus, listen, we will be changed. We will tr be transformed from, from mortal to immortality. Listen to what, what uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18 says. It says, But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being, here's the word, transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. And God wants to transform our lives, and in fact, He will transform our lives if we've trusted Christ as our Lord and Savior. Paul said this to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 15, 53. He said, our dying bodies must be transformed into bodies that will never die. Our mortal bodies must be transformed into immortal bodies. Listen, he says they must be transformed. That word must, it means it's necessary. It means it's needful. It means that it's right and that it's proper for our bodies to be transformed. Why? Because your body is not made for eternity, your physical body. Your physical body is not fit for eternity. The Bible says that no flesh can glory in God's presence. And so what does Jesus do here in Luke chapter 9? He takes his disciples up on the mountaintop, takes them up there to pray. And as they prayed, his appearance transforms before them and Moses and Elijah appear and they discuss Jesus' decease which he was about to accomplish. Now, there's a lot to unpack there. Let's jump right in. For starters, notice where this vision of transformation starts. Notice where it starts. It starts in prayer. The vision of transformation, it begins in prayer. Truly, the greatest privilege that a Christian has is the privilege of prayer. Because listen, prayer is where God's glory is revealed to you and me. Prayer is where God's glory is found. That's where it's revealed to us. And it's not only our greatest privilege to pray, listen, it's our greatest responsibility. Jesus will say in Luke chapter 18 that men should always pray and not lose heart. Why does he say that? Here's why. Because when you and I pray, we admit our need for God and our total dependence upon God. In other words, listen, prayer it is not like hitting a pinata with a stick. A lot of people think of prayer and they equate prayer like, hey, you know what, God's the pinata and prayer is the stick and if I just hit him enough with prayer, all the goodies are going to come falling out. 
That's not what prayer is all about. Listen, prayer is not intended to be a means of trying to get from God what we want. Listen, rather, prayer is supposed to be the means by which we yield to God so that he can give us what he wants. That's what prayer is all about. Billy Graham said this. He said that prayer is the rope that pulls God and man together, but it doesn't pull God down to us. Rather, it pulls us up to him. And listen, Jesus here, he's pulling his disciples up to see the coming hope of every believer. He's pulling them up to see the, the, his glorification, to see his glory, which is the only place we're going to find it is in prayer. But he's also wanting to see, just as he is glorified, that we also will be glorified together with him. And in so doing, he's giving them this encouragement. Listen, guys, it's all worth it. It's all worth it. Jesus' work on his cross for our salvation is worth it. Jesus' work through our cross for our sanctification. Listen, it's worth it. And it's all worth it because at the end of it awaits this marvelous glorification. It's all worth it. We need to understand. And it's prayer that pulls us up to see that. It's prayer that pulls us up to see that God is glorified. As well, notice what prayer also pulls up these disciples to see. It pulls them up to see Moses and Elijah. Now, why is it that Moses and Elijah are appearing here with Jesus? Why isn't it Abraham? Why isn't it David? Why isn't it Joshua? Why isn't it, you know, Joseph or Daniel? So many great people that Jesus could be meeting with. Why is it Moses and Elijah? Well, there's several possibilities. I want to name a few, but I'll tell you what I think it is. The, the possibilities might be, hey, Moses and Elijah, they represent those who are caught up to meet God. Right? Moses represents those who die and glow, go into glory. Elijah, who was caught up in a whirlwind and never died, he represents those who are going to be caught up to heaven in the rapture, in, 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 you know, in death, as you know, 1 Thessalonians 4 talks about. That's one possibility. Another possibility that it's Moses and Elijah is that they, these two guys factor into, figure into prophecy. And specifically in, in Revelation chapter 11, when it talks about the two witnesses, it's, it's widely speculated that it's Moses and Elijah that are the two witnesses that show up in, in the book of Revelation. But, but here's why I think the most obvious possibility, why is it Moses and Elijah that Jesus is talking about? <coughs> well, because Moses represents the law and Elijah represents the prophets. And, you know, the, old, the significance of that is that, that together they represent the Old Testament revelation of Jesus Christ. The Old Testament law points us to our need for Jesus, and the Old Testament prophecies point us to the coming of Jesus. And what do they do when they get together with Jesus? Well, on this Mount of Transfiguration, what you have is the fulfillment of the law and the prophets because they're talking about his, his decease. They're talking about his, his death, his burial, his resurrection. All, all, all the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. As a matter of fact, Jesus said in Matthew's gospel, Matthew 5, 17, do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, to destroy, but to fulfill. And so the, the, how, how does Jesus do that? Notice again there, verse 31, it says, They spoke of his decease, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. See, everything hinges on the cross of Christ. Everything hinges on that cross of Christ. Now, interestingly, they spoke of his decease, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. That word in the Greek, it's exodus. That's the word. And, and the reference to Israel, escape from Egypt, it has to be right there in our mind's eye. And here's the connection. The Bible says that there have been many who have been taken captive by Satan to do his will. And, and what happened is that Jesus, he came to create an exodus. He came to set the captives free. Jesus said this back in Luke's gospel, back in Luke chapter 4, verse 18. He said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and the recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. Let me bring this home to you today. 
Maybe today you need an exodus in your life. Maybe today you need to be set free. Maybe today you need to be liberated from the bondage of sin. Let me tell you, the law can't do that. The law is powerless to do that. Doing good, trying hard, will not do this. Only Jesus Christ can set you free from that bondage. And so this is what Jesus is doing here in this transfiguration. He appears with Moses, the representative of the law, appears with Elijah, the representative of the prophets, and Jesus says, hey, I'm going to talk to you about how I'm going to fulfill the law and the prophets. I'm going to talk to you about my, my decease, the cross of Christ that's coming up in Jerusalem. But I want you to notice there in verse 32, what do we read? It says, but Peter... And those with him were heavy with sleep. And when they were fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. Let me just go off on a tangent here real quick, and I ain't got time to do it. When they were fully awake, they saw the glory of God. Are you awake this morning, church? Are you awake to the glory of God? Because what happens is we sleep through life. We can even sleep when we get together, when we pray. We got together this morning. We get together every Sunday morning. We get together, the, the leaders and myself, and we pray. 7 a.m. in the chapel. We're praying. You're welcome. Every last one of you is welcome. Let's pack the place out so we need to meet here at 7 a.m. to pray. We're praying. We're asking the Lord to meet us here, to move, to pour out his spirit, to open our eyes to the things that God wants to do so that we can see his glory. And guys, we need to see God's glory today. We have to see it. You need to see it in your life. Some of you are desperate for the glory of God, and what you've settled for is a sleepwalking life where you come into church, and it's just the old routine, and it's, where am I going to lunch? And I had to, to, to call our prayer meeting short this morning and say, guys, let me read to you what we are studying today. Because I am not seeing this wakefulness in our attitude of prayer right now. What I'm seeing is we're just going through the motions. We're just praying. We're saying the right things. But where is your heart? And where is your mind? And are you awake to what God wants to do? I ask you that same question. Are you awake to what God wants you to do? Because when we will wake up and we will say, God, what is it that you want to do? I'm praying. I'm seeking. And I'm wide awake, God. Show me the moving work of your Holy Spirit. you will blow your mind. He will show up. His glory will be manifested. And that's my prayer for you. That's my prayer for me. We can't settle for anything less. I don't want a church that goes through life sleepwalking. I don't want to come in and have God bless us and go, oh, thanks for the great building, God. And now let me think about where I'm going to go for lunch afterwards today. I want to come here with a heart of expectancy, and I want to say, God, move and work. And so what happens, we've got these things that are threatening. We've got these things that are threatening Peter right now from being engaged and seeing the glory of God. What is it? Well, the first one, you see it there, it's sleepiness. It, it, I love what David Guzik said. He said, it's remarkable to think that one might be in the presence of tremendous glory and yet still be heavy with sleep. Jesus' glory was present all the time, and yet they only saw it when they were awakened. By analogy, he says, we note that spiritual sleep keeps many from seeing or experiencing the glory of God. Maybe you're asleep today. Maybe you need to wake up. Maybe you need to say, God, wake me up. Show me what's going on around me. Paul, in Romans chapter 13, he was talking there about the importance of operating in love and and seeking the Lord. And here's what he said. He said, do this knowing the time that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now our salvation is nearer than we first believed. Maybe that needs to be the cry of our heart today. Wake me up, God. Show me what's going on here. Well, I said there's two things that threaten to get in the way here of these guys seeing God's glory. First one is sleepiness. The second thing is settling. Settling. Just settling for, hey, this is good enough. Notice what's Peter say there in verse 33? Man, there, it's happened as they were parting from him. What this means is Moses and Elijah were splitting. They're, they're getting out of there. And Peter's like, oh, hey, oh, oh don't, don't go so fast. And so what happens, Peter says to Jesus, Master, it's good for us to be here. Let's, let's set up shop, man. Let's build three tabernacles. 
One for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah, kind of puts them on the same level as Jesus. It's like, hey, let's just camp out right here. This glory is amazing. I don't want anything. Let's just stay right here in this experience. But notice the key word there back in verse 31. They spoke, what did they speak of when they were together, Moses and Elijah and Jesus? They spoke of his decease, which he was about to accomplish. Point is, Jesus' work hadn't yet been accomplished, right? This is a wonderful picture of what Jesus is going to do and of what Peter and the disciples have looked forward to, but they're not there yet. Jesus has not died on the cross. He has not given his life as a ransom for many. And so, so here, you know, it's kind of like this. You go on a diet. And you're all excited about your diet, and you go and you buy a new workout outfit, and you go and you buy new tennis shoes, and you go and you toss all your food out and go get all the good diet food, and you're feeling really good about it. What haven't you done? You haven't worked out, and you haven't started your diet yet, right? And so Peter's like, let's just stay right here. This is awesome. No, 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 no. The glory, hey, man, it hasn't started yet. This is all just preparation, man. It doesn't mean anything yet until you live it out. And so God shows up in this cloud. His Shekinah glory shows up. And you know it's God because they're in fear. And God shows up. It's it's, it's not all, hey, it's like a seriousness. God shows up. And he says, this is my beloved son. Hear him. What's God saying here? Just wrap it all up right here. Hey, the glory doesn't come through the law. The glory doesn't come through the prophets. Listen, the glory doesn't come through the neat experience that you had with God. And some of us, we have this neat experience with God, and that's what we want to hold on to. And it's all about looking back to this unique experience that we had with God. And God says, listen, the glory comes through Jesus. That's who the glory comes through. Our glorification only comes when we look to Jesus And when we hear his words, it's not about an experience. It's about Jesus. Are you looking to him today? That's my question.